And let's begin. Um, <laughs> so, good day, everyone. Today, I will tell you about my ongoing project. It is a hobby project. It's been happening in my free time, so it's quite slow. It takes many, many months, months to, to accomplish stuff. Uh, in this is not just simple presentation. I will not just scroll through with 10 million slides. I, I will tell, uh, try to tell a story. What were my adventures and what I found and what I decided and how it's been solved. So a uh, short word about myself. My name is uh, Dmitro Litovchenko. Uh, I work here in Stockholm for Erlang Solutions for the past five years. My Erlang experience stretches two years longer and my programming experience goes back to 90s. I started programming basic back in school uh, and then C and C++ I, I, I took like somewhere at the age of 15 or something that was 1995. So th this is this is most relevant because my project is is C++ and Erlang. Uh, also, since uh, four years ago, since 2013, I've been doing some translations of educational material and books to Russian. I translated "Learn You Some Erlang for Great Good" to Russian. That's the paper, the paperback. Uh, Designing for Scalability by Francesco Cesarini and uh, Steve Inoski, that's the other one, also in Russian. And I translated these two things. Uh, they are not on paper, they are published, just uh, handbook is on ESL's GitHub and uh, Erlang in Anger is on my GitHub. <laughs> also, while working, while working on my project, I, I, I have noticed that, that it's too much knowledge in my head. It, it, it just going to get lost. If, if the time passes, it vanishes. So I created a website where I started storing all my knowledge and facts in the um, form of simple to read articles and as well as advanced articles. So it has two, it has two parts easy to read in form of ELI5, explain me like I'm five. It's very simple in English. And the second part is bottom on the front page is more advanced, like technical knowledge facts, like how the data is structured, how the BIM file is structured, what are the opcodes and so on. So it's documentation which was hard to find before, which I have found structured and saved in uh, form of articles. And then one day I thought to myself, let's run some Erlang, but not on Ericsson's Erlang. And the, the first question that comes to my head, where do I begin? So you can, uh, as an example, you can imagine yourself trying to begin a new hobby. For example, metalworking. I really like metalworking. I never did a single thing in metal, but I really like it, like from far, from distance. So where do I begin? Uh, I have no pr prior experience. I never did anything like this. But what tools do I need? What materials do I need? How to organize my workshop? What are the safety requirements? What power even will I need in my workshop to, to, to start it? So the same for, 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 my, for my project to run Erlang, where do I begin? I had no idea. So I started Googling, I started reading white papers, books, uh, source code, everything I could find. So I didn't come empty handed, of course I, it wasn't blank in my head, I had some experience before. So well, this all went together. So first, to run something, to run something, I need the code. The any any form of code, but well, for for a virtual machine, it should be bytecode. I could well, I found, uh, for example, I found uh, Erlang interpreter. Closer. Oh, it's really deafening. Okay, so. <laughs> 
So, for example, I found uh, on a GitHub, I found a project by Tony Rockball, which executes, uh, interprets Erlang uh, syntax tree or Erlang beam assembly in Erlang form. I used it as a source of knowledge, the first source which helped me loading the beam file. And this was my basically three sources of knowledge where do you begin if you want to understand how it works. So, uh, and main, main uh, well, the ba base of everything is, is the compiler, the OTP application which writes these modules. So it's the source of truth. Uh, of course, I had to consult it too. It's not the easiest read though. The next comes the data. Uh, well, assume I, I parsed the beam somehow. I figured out the f data format in it. It's not easy. It's compact. Some bits uh, use, used to, to write it more compact. And assume I, I did it. Next comes the data. What is, uh, what, how, how does it look in memory? I, I need to represent it somehow nicely. And uh, this still, at this point, it still wasn't uh, oriented for a microcontroller. It was just, I, I just was just making an Erlang from scratch to interpret, to make a virtual machine. So to compare it, for example, to Java or to Python, how they represent data in memory. And in memory, they have uh, every value in memory in those languages has a, at least two words as a pointer to virtual table and to, to, to class. So integer is a class, your own class is a class of object, and double is a class, and so on. This isn't the case in Erlang, because Erlang uses more compact representation. I had to find it, I had to learn it, how it works. And also, it's documented on my website now, because, well, I had to, to know it, it was too much in my head, I had to write it down. And then, like, one more question, I, I found in the code so much, so much this was mentioned, what is a boxed value? What is a box? So box is anything that does not fit in, in a word, does not fit in a register. You put it somewhere in memory and store the pointer. That's the box. So these, these, these things were confusing. I had to find them and document them. And later this year, like a few months ago, uh, Eric Stenman published his his, his uh, BIM book on GitHub, which contains parts of what I already found and documented, so he, he knew it all the way along. And now I'm also contributing to his book. Uh, this is the timeline of, of my project. It started two and a half years ago, when, when I basically started with zero knowledge and started doing the parsing beam format, interpreting, doing everything to run the code. It was also the most successful project, if I look back, it, it, of my several attempts. The, the latest one took several stages. It was the most successful project. It did most of, of, of them all. So, then, so, so at this point, I, I stopped, thought to myself what really I want to build, why I'm doing this, who wants it? So then a year has passed, I was busy translating the scalability book. I also had public presentation of my pro product on the same year on uh, Erlang Solutions company meeting. It had some positive response for a hobby project that was just done in my free evenings. And uh, in 2016, I also had some exposure to OTP source. I was working with the OTP team I added, if you remember, the keynote from the start of the day by uh, Kenneth Lundin. He mentioned that OTP20 now has a garbage collect call with options to do my major or minor. That was mine. And also I did, I refactored garbage collector code, but it, it was satisfying and stable, but didn't make it into the master branch. For some reason, we decided to not do it yet. So end of 2016, I have started the new project with a new vision. I understood that the first one is, it does not have the target audience. It does not have the use case. It just 
goes parallel with OTP and gives nothing to, to, to people. So who would want to use it? And then I came to the idea that the world probably needs smaller, smaller virtual machine that will run Erlang. And there it started. So, so the, this started in 2014. This is the first project. It's on GitHub. If you ever are interested to look on the simplest code to load Beam files, it parses normal Beam files from your compiler. It's fairly successful. It's, it has uh, basic data types. It has processes, process heaps, message passing, receiving, exceptions. It does not have catch though, but you can create exceptions and crash your processes. It has closures and all that basic stuff that you need to run simple thing. Also, it was able to encode JSON using Mocky JSON. I just loaded module, called it, and it produced result. Um, uh, this is the, the logo I created for it. Uh, already then, I was guessing that probably the target should be something small. So I started munching on those little chips. Um, and So, yeah, this was the same slide. Okay. Now the interesting part. This is the printout of when you just get the source from GitHub and run make. Uh, so it, this screenshot pr shows a lot of interesting pieces and facts which I already mentioned. So for example, it finds modules automatically. This part, uh, hard coded, so when I used it on 19, it I had to change num version numbers, and then it started actually, before it was complaining the module is not found. So it finds beam files. It finds the function, it has scheduler. Scheduler runs Q3, which means normal priority queue. It switches quite often because I lowered the threshold of reductions to monitor how it behaves. Because if I do 2000 and it crashes after 10 opcodes, that's not interesting. So I lowered the threshold of switching, it has speeds, it can do calls, it can uh, create, here it can create functions, these are closures, it can call them, it can call normal functions, and also it creates an exception here somewhere, a new error, I think, that creates an exception, then it crashes. So good stuff. I think this is the most successful, this is the most far I've got with uh, uh, interpreting Beam. Uh, I will tell later the, how the latest uh, attempt goes. Uh, next milestone in this project, where I stopped, was to make Erlang init run and to enter the shell. But init does a lot of magic in it to, to, to get running its spawns processes, which were easy for me. It does monitoring linking between them, which was almost easy. Then it crushes something or thing sends an exception for some reason. And that was too much, I did not have an exception so I could not pass through that breakpoint, so I could not make init run yet. Then I realized that it's too much, and I slowed down, the year ended, next year was the book, and next year was the new project, which continues this idea. So basically it was discontinued at that point. Then I also, end of 2016, I ordered, 2015, I ordered garbage collection handbook, so I, now I know much more about garbage collection, and I worked with garbage collector in OTP, so I have this knowledge now, and it's ready to be used. It's just coming to it soon. So this project was stopped. It's still on GitHub, it's still runnable. If anyone is interested, it's there. That's the book. Now, uh, end of 2016, I realized that there is this small, J1 fourth implementation, which is like few pages of Go, but I could implement it in C, in C++. And I was thinking to myself, like, let's try adapt it and make Erlang run on this. It's very small, it's, it's very promising. And that example is a piece of fourth code that, that calculates Mandelbrot fractal picture. 
just just to get the feeling what Fort is for those who don't know it. It's it's very simple. It's a stack based language. The, this is the first problem. It's stack based, and Erlang is register based. So, but that wasn't the biggest problem of mine. And the J1 Fort has just four instructions. The, all the magic happens in this ALU instruction, which has bits saying what to do with data, what to take from stack, what to move from stack, what to increase, what to decrease. It's all encoded in bits. So this function uh, does all the magic, does all the fault functions you can implement with it, with single opcode. And it has a VHDL implementation. VHDL is a electronic circuit description language, which you can use to build physical chips or program FPGA to run it. So J1 fourth can do it, and I was thinking to myself, uh, let's do some modifications here and there, maybe it will work for me and I can run Erlang CPU, right? Not too fast, run. So this is the compiler chain. The, 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 the left to right chain is the original Ericsson's compiler, LC. It takes source, preprocesses, makes core, does some magic, produces kernel, beam assembly, and there we have beam file. We can run it. It's ready on our disk. I tried the core initially. It was going mostly well. I was producing my fort from it. I was compiling to bytecode. It looked good. It made my eyes happy. And then at some point, I came to pattern matching. And that is the horror. So pattern matching is Pattern matching must be compiled into a decision tree. So it takes pieces from left, pieces from right, checks if the variable is defined, what's the type, what to do next, is it all match variable, is it, and so on. So it th this algorithm for building this tree was not so easy, it was not so simple. And I understood that it's not, it's out of scope, I don't want to do this in this project. Then I looked down the chain into kernel, and kernel already has it done. So basically I just switched to kernel. I rewrote my input to take kernel, it was very similar, it was not hard. And now I have pattern match. Pattern match is compiled into decision trees already, just a tree of ifs or something, tree of <laughs> checks of values and types. So the chain now looks like this. My, my, my tool called E4C, it's a part of compiler application. It takes, it invokes an Erlang compiler, takes kernel stage, produces j one fourth text as a list of strings, which I can as well parse from source file if I want to write simple fourth. And then the next tool, the same, same program but different application produces bytecode. Two stages, very simple. So I was adding more and more opcodes because four were, were just not enough. I, 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 I really thought that making everything with four opcodes would work, but it would be too slow. So I started adding more and more opcodes to do Erlang things. And it was without any system on the hit and miss basis. I tried to pack up codes to save memory. I tried here and there, optimize, prototype. It was really easy in Erlang. I really love writing this tool in Erlang. And it turned out that I will eventually have huge code. The, 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 the virtual bytecode, it will be big, and I don't have so much memory. I started realizing I want it to be very small. I'm targeting microcontrollers. So at some point, I, I, I just separated this problem. I will have to work with code size later. Let's make it work first. And then another problem, J1 has 16-bit words for opcodes, and that's not enough. Erlang runs on 32-bit minimum to encode all the good stuff, all the integers, all the pointers, all the words. They have 32-bit size. It does not fit in 16-bit. I have to do various clever tricks to encode longer integers. It also, it was progressing. I, I, I started like working around and going here and there, trying to make it work. It almost worked, but then I it, it just noticed the complexity grows out of control. 
So these are the opcodes I defined, plus four marked the original J1. And I noticed that the more my language grows, the less I'm using, or I'm not stopped using at all those first four opcodes. They just have different semantic. They, they don't map to Erlang at all. And the new language looks more and more like Beam and less and less like Fourth. So do I need Fourth here at all? I, I ask myself. So probably 16-bit Fourth was not ready for this. What a surprise. But still, the idea was very nice. Having the, the, the small Fourth supported Erlang interpreter is still possible, but I will have to come to it again, maybe. So well, we may have Erlang CPU eventually from this. It may run it. It may run it at a good speed, possibly, just not yet. But I tried this. I liked it. It almost worked. Now, new round of ideas. This one was short, but very promising. So let's look at LLVM. I said to myself, since I have a runtime library for Erlang anyway. It's in C++. It has all the types, the processes, the, all the stuff Erlang needs, it, I already have. And so let's compile Erlang module to LLVM. It also has single static assignment, SSA. So I just keep assigning names to numbers, and it all works well, in theory. A pleasant coincidence, I thought to myself. But then also, why, why I was thinking to go here I believe that I may save some, some code size. So typically, when you load Beam in memory, it expands by the factor of 4 to 6. On 64 bits, Beam grows six times. So that's not really good for a microcontroller, because Erlang's core application, e ERTS, is 400 kilobytes. And my goal was to go under half megabyte, and it will blow. It, it, it just just not something I really can handle at that size. So I decided maybe LLVM can help me. And here I did my first mistake, the major mistake for this project. I took Erlang AST. That's the Erlang, parsed Erlang. It was going almost well, but the complexity exploded too fast. If I come back to this idea, I would have to go somewhere down the pipeline, like kernel, for example, because it has so many things conveniently compiled for me. So this took too much focus and brain power to get this going. LLVM is very good stuff for this. It could work, in theory, but it's really slow to build. I must use the source, because from libraries it's not really working. If I link with libraries, well, it didn't work for me. I had to build from source. Source is huge. It's like 5 gigs for my virtual machine. The, the virtual box, that's too much. Well, it almost. And it, it brought my virtual machine down when linking it. So And it builds 700 megabyte executables. It's almost a gig. Almost a gig. Uh, so I, I was thinking to myself, it's probably too big. I need to take it out on my computer, not in the virtual machine. That's too much. And uh, hot code loading would break. It would never exist because I, I'm linking, I'm statically linking on to, to, to make a ROM, to flush it on the chip. So this was basically a deal breaker for Erlang. You, it's, it's the selling point. You, you don't have code reloading on it anymore. You have to reflush. You can't just push one module and reload. You have to reflush the whole thing. So this was a cool idea. I liked it. But it it was too hard to build. Well, it's like too slow. It was too slow. It was the complex thing. Uh, a team could make it, not me alone. So team probably does JIT now in in Ericsson. And they, they face the same complexities, but they have more power to do it. Now a moment of helpful references. Uh, reference how, how virtual machine works, how, how OTP works as well. It's the same principle, and I'm using it as well. So imagine you have a BIM file, which has opcodes and arguments encoded in some compact way, like 8 bits here, 16 bits there, opcode, 8 more bits, 1 byte op. So it, this is like 6 bytes or 7 bytes. Then when the virtual machine is starting, it 
enters the VM loop function, uh, which has labels to do every opcode. But labels are internal to the function. You cannot see them from outside. So you have to enter it first with the, that variable set to true. It will jump down here, fill this global array conveniently for me, and exit. Then I can load this code. I see opcode. I take that label 0, put it here, 4 bytes gone. I see argument. It's small, but Erlang has everything in word size. It becomes 4 bytes here, 32 bits, gone. Then expand as well. Op next top code, I take address, put it here, 4 more bytes, 4 more bytes. Then it, it bloats to 24 bytes now. But this approach is well known to me. It's used in uh, all the virtual machines we have now, in Ericsson's OTP and in Link as well. They use same approach. This is the fastest approach. And uh, the next to it goes switch case approach when you just store up code instead, take them, do switch, and do some magic, jump to next, take it, do switch, some magic, this the next by speed, but it's like 20% faster. So I decided to do the familiar way. It's not memory efficient. I will have to redo it later, but that's not so hard. So this is basically the, 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 the data from Wikipedia. You can find it, how, how different threading models work. This is direct threading. Uh, this is what we use in our virtual machines everywhere. And then when uh, the time comes to run this code we have loaded, we enter VM loop again with init false. It skips to here. It, I omitted some code. We do go to address. We just take this label and jump to it. Jump here, do something, go to next. It says B. Jump here, do something, go to next, and so on. So this is very fast. It jumps, it's like it's threaded. Execution is threaded through the VM loop and does the magic, does the work. And it's very fast. It's the fastest we have before JIT. Now the last project, which is uh, running now. It's most successful so far. I like it most. It's not so well, not so advanced like the first one. But at least I have a goal now. I want it small. I want it to fit on the small things. Now I had to invent a custom beam-like format. Why? Because I want to have preprocessing done ahead of time and then I don't need this code on the virtual machine on the chip. So I, I save space here. That's why I write some prepared format. And now it is similar to Beam, but not Beam exactly. And it also, like Erlang OTP, this is a direct threaded emulator, which uses go to table. I'm aware about different ways to do it. For more compact code, I can use uh, Huffman coding to uh, encode opcodes in as few bits of, as possible according to their frequency. And this idea uh, here is to the use instruction set. Uh, OTP has 158 instructions up to date. And uh, I'm, I have like 30 or around 20, but it will grow. And the rest of the work is offloaded to BIFs. So two, two ways to represent the code, and, and, and this is what I've been talking to. So to run faster, I put label addresses in memory, and arguments follow, and they all take full word. So this is the fastest approach. It's absolutely not efficient memory-wise. I'm losing so much memory here, so I could improve this. But uh, being on Intel, this is very easy to read single bytes. It's cheap. Intel is able to access single bytes. When I come to ARM, access to single bytes becomes much harder because lower ARM models don't allow unaligned reads on addresses that are not multiplies of four. And higher ARM models are more lenient to this. They allow it. But it's lower. They still have to read full byte, full word. So approach to same memory would be to place one byte here with opcode, some argument, some shorter argument, another opcode, and so on. 
or uh, similar to Huffman coding, which would use bits instead of bytes, to, because well, some, some frequent opcodes can take two, three, four bits instead of eight. So this is, uh, so the lower one is how I do now, and this is the same way how Ericsson's OTP does. Uh, now the library code, that's the biggest problem I have to come to approach and to solve. The library code is, is really big, it's huge. The ERTS has 400 kilobytes of BIM files. I can probably shrink it, just removing the bug info and compressing it here and there, but still it's too much. Then standard library is three megabytes, but I don't have, don't have to store everything in memory, I just need a few modules. And everything is absolutely blowing. So I, I will definitely have to solve this just after I have it working. Yeah, after I have it working, I will have to shrink it. Cut per functions, aggressive unloading, compressing the Huffman coding for, for code and so on. And probably I could even do garbage collection on code. I think it was Joe Armstrong who mentioned it somewhere in mail list or on one of the meetups that you could garbage collect the code per function. Here is my current progress. Can you see the colors well? So the black ones are the best progress. I, it's mostly done, it works. I, I'm taking pieces from the first project that's glue on VM. The blue ones have major progress, so they work mostly. They don't, they're not completed, I'm happy with them. So transpiler is proof of concept is ready and does the job. Code loader is fine. I will have to redo it for new format if I change the format. Modules are fine, but I, I will have to add more aggressive code management here. VM loop is not fine, but I have it in glue and I will take it. That's okay. Data types mostly done, except few things like maps and binaries. I will come to them. Major and minor opcodes. The, the, they, they are not done, but I have them. So I will just migrate them. Major beefs as well, I have the stuff that was needed first, I have it. So I will migrate it from Gluon. The green stuff is the stuff that's not there at all, but I know how to pull it off. I have the knowledge. So GC I know, running on ARM, I understand how ARM works. I played with the simulator, I played with the board. I took a couple of programming courses, so we are coming there. I, the simulator, I, I have the, 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 the 384K simulator that I can play with, also ARM. So distribution, I currently do the Python, Erlang node in Python. So distribution protocol, I, I work with it right now, I know how it works. So distribution will come easily. And then I can, uh, reports, how, how, how what, what, what can you really interact on a chip without external chips? So you, you just have GPIO pins, that's it. Unless you plug in some, some shields with Wi-Fi and USB and everything. So that part is unclear in hardware drivers. That's unclear until I have the use case. I, I'm not doing it because I don't know. I don't know what will be needed. And the library's uh, size I just discussed, as well as network, so th that was, I have no idea how to do network, but I will have the embedded o OS under me that's like, that possibly has TCP stack. I think it can, can enable it. So that part is, that part is not, not scaring me much. We will come there. Now that I cleared everything for me, what's in front of me, what's waiting for me, I don't know exact platform where my project will be running. I'm just targeting the biggest family of ARM processors and half megabyte limit is self-imposed. I'm just trying to limit myself and limit things run running. The drivers I just mentioned, I have no idea what the hardware I will have, but we will begin with the, at least disk storage and maybe GPIO, so that we'll see where it goes from there. And I try to keep it super small, so to like to cut off every piece of work that's not immediately needed to have a chance to finish it. And it's still hundreds of hours of work. Uh, now that I have created this presentation, I look back at the evolution and it makes perfect sense to, for me, 
to create a special edition for Erlang, like smaller Java SE and tiny Java ME. And Java ME requires just 30 kilobytes to run. It runs on your SIM cards in your pocket. So, and on your bank cards as well. So you can call it Erlang Embedded or give it any other name, but it would be something that I can direct my feet to and make embedded small subset of Erlang. Of course, there will be no, m no point of discussing compatibility with your legacy code and running your business logic on this tiny interpreter, but it will still be Erlang, it will still be limited, and it will fit, and you will have to write for it, not run your legacy on it. Uh, that's that's the, the latest idea, the last idea I got like yesterday. Makes perfect sense to me. Because it, it otherwise it will go in mega, the count will go up to megabytes uh, to fit everything, to run everything. It will easily hit megabytes. I, I'm not I'm not reaching my goal then. So I will need all support I can get from the members of community. I need your comments, ideas, possible use cases, hints what I can trim, make smaller, and so on. So the project is con uh, project continues. It's in full at full speed. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, am I planning to do it FPJ? It's it's the, it's something that became possible when I looked into J1 fourth, because J1 fourth has very simple VHDL implementation. So I in in theory I can build on top of it, and I can make it run in just make maybe extend it to bigger bit width so I can and, and encode bigger numbers, but in theory it could be extended to to run like this. I just left this idea as promising, and moved on. But it's still there, it's in my head, I remember it. So Erlang CPU is possible, but not in, in, in with the 158 of codes we have now. That would be too big, uh, no FPGA will fit it. Uh, Runtime is my own. It's, it's, it's a C++ source with data types, with uh, everything I need, with beefs, with the processes, messages, scheduling, everything is there. It's, it's my own. So the, the first screenshot I had like 20 slides ago, this, this everything is my code. It's, it's been written from scratch. So it's, this is the runtime. And it's, it's quite small, it's like this one that can do this, it's about 35 kilos without C library. So with C library it can be maybe 50 or 60, I guess. It, 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 of course it will grow when I write more beefs and I do everything, it will grow, but not so much. Thank you. Thank you.